It is my honor and privilege to introduce Dr. David Solomon. Oh. Thanks. I, I'd really like to thank um, Adrian and everybody here for inviting me. It's an incredible honor to come here to give this talk. And thank you, Jen. Uh, I was wondering who you were talking about there. <laughs> Thanks. Let me get my presentation going here. Okay. And it's really an honor to be here to uh, celebrate uh, Open Access Week with you uh, today. Uh, but along with o Open Access Week, I'd, I'd like to propose that we also celebrate the technology that made open access possible, the ability to distribute journals um, over uh, dig uh, dig digitally over uh, wide area networks, because this has just changed um, scholarly publishing in so many ways, and uh, most very good, I think, but some maybe not so good. And I think if we want to understand open access, we have to understand it in the context of uh, digital distribution and all of and how it is uh, impacted on uh, scholarly publishing. Uh, I'd like to try to cover three points in my, uh, my talk. First of all, I'd like to uh, place open access in kind of a historical context. And I feel a little um, bowed now that uh, Steve is such a, a great historian. But I think it's uh, important, to, if we're going to think about open access, where it is and where it's going to go, in, I think about, we, have, we have to think about where it's come from. Secondly, I'd like to uh, provide a, an overview on some of the research on the growth and direction of open access publishing. And by the way, uh, my focus is on open access journals. Uh, I know open access is much broader than that. Um, uh, first of all, given the time, and also um, my area has really been the focus of journals, and, 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 and I'm, so I'm not going to really talk that much about monographs and other types of data and other types of open, open access. Um, but I would like to talk to you about some of the research and where we've been, where we are right now, and where we seem to be going. And finally, in the last uh, few minutes, I'd like to talk about what I see as three very exciting kind of next steps that are just coming online this year and may kind of point to how we move farther in the future in terms of open access. Um, uh, as I said, uh, uh, about 20 years ago, digital distribution of scholarly journals became possible. Now, there were digital journals out at least, uh, basically, probably as long as there are. There's been wide area networks, but uh, um, at least as early as the early 1980s. But these were text-based. There was relatively few people who could access these wide area networks, and they really weren't a viable replacement for our paper journal system. But about 20 years ago, three technological innovations kind of uh, came together that, uh, at least in my view, made it possible to distribute journals over the uh, internet that were on par with the kind of journals that we were distributing on paper. And they were, first of all, a uh, open, uh, uh, the internet reaching a critical mass. Uh, so about 20 years ago, uh, in the early 1990s, most faculty members at universities like uh, University of Kentucky could get access to the internet if they wanted to, or if they, uh, most of them already had access to the internet. Secondly, this, the uh, protocols that allowed us to transmit uh, a, a formatted text, uh, images, pictures, even sound and video had become available, so it was now possible to do this in a systematic way. And then finally, uh, by the way, how many of you remember uh, Mosaic? Has, has this, any of you, yeah, a few of you out there were, well, Mosaic came along and, uh, uh, which of course was the first uh, readily available browser software. And it, uh, it allowed people who weren't, didn't have a PhD in computer science to easily access the internet, to download these journals and read them. And so with these three together, it became possible to distribute uh, journals electronically that were on par, at least in my view, with um, paper journals. And when this happened, uh, there were a, a number of very insightful people that uh, started asking, well, what is this going to do to our scholarly publishing system? How is this going to change our, policy, our scholarly publishing system? It's such a different media. 
and what's going to happen here. And one of them, one of them that's really kind of influenced my thinking uh, was a uh, woman, Ann Schaffner, who wrote the article, what the, uh, the Future of Scientific Journals, Lessons from the Past. And she, she made two, what I think are important points. First of all, if we, uh, again, this was 1994, if we're going to understand what's going to happen with our scholarly publishing system as we move into this kind of new, brave new world of uh, digital publishing, we probably should look back and see how our papers journal system evolved. And maybe we can learn something from that in, in terms of how our digital distribution, uh, dis digitally distributed uh, scholarly publishing system is going to evolve. And secondly, uh, she said, we need to consider the roles that journals play in scientific <coughs> societies uh, if we're going to understand how this new media is and how and try to figure out how this, uh, uh, these, new, these roles are going to be uh, uh, fulfilled by this new media. And she <coughs> proposed five different roles. And at least in my view, uh, these roles make a lot of sense. And these are in the order that she thought of important. First of all, our scholarly publishing, our, our, our journals serve as our collective knowledge base, They're really our archive of knowledge. It's where we turn when we want to find out the most up-to-date uh, uh, information uh, in a field, is we usually turn to the journals. Not that books and so on aren't important, but, uh, but in, in most, at least scientific fields, they usually the most up-to-date information is in our journals. Secondly, these journals serve as a means of communicating information. In some ways, that sounds the same, but he's, uh, she's really talking about a different kind of communication, the interactive communication between scholars working in a particular area. And you might say now, you know, in, in an electronic world, maybe journals don't serve that purpose all that well. Well, I think, well, to some extent that's true, but journals and journal-like things still, I think, play an important role in, where, in the way that scholars communicate amongst themselves. And we'll talk more about that. In fact, uh, our journal system also serves as a means of validating the quality of research through peer review, editing, and so on, ensuring that knowledge base is uh, as accurate and as uh, well done as possible. Uh, our journal system all also serves as a means for distributing rewards. It's how we, uh, as, as scholars, uh, to a large extent, are, are judged. It also serves as a way that um, uh, a way that scholars, uh, as Jean Claude Guidon said, uh, it serves almost like a patent office where. Uh, or a scholar can say, I came up with that idea, a new finding. The way you document that is through publication. And finally, journals also serve as a means of building scientific communities uh, in, in terms of the, the editorials, the editors, the editors. It's where scholars talk about their profession as well. These are the kind of the traditional um, uh, roles that journals have served. Uh, if we look back, uh, as probably many of you know, uh, most, most uh, historians consider the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of London, which was published in 1665 as the first scholarly journal. And, and uh, just give them time, I'm not going to go into a lot of history and so on, but I do want to make some points about this. Starting with uh, what's often called Phil Trad's Journals have tech, uh, generally been based within scholarly communities and scholarly societies. And they've, the scholarly si uh, societies have published these journals at great cost. Uh, it was very expensive, obviously, to publish journals back then. And it stayed that way well up until past World War II. Journals published, uh, or uh, societies published journals at, uh, at cost. They had to subsidize them. And scholars oftentimes had to pay page charges, again, to help subsidize these journals. Uh, and uh, 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 thirdly, uh, these journals evolved slowly over time. If you looked at uh, first issues of Phil uh, Trans, which is still published, uh, by the way, uh, it w you, you might not recognize it as a scholarly journal. Things like um, uh, referencing systems, abstracts, the organization of articles, all of that evolved slowly over time. And so really what you think about it, a very efficient system for, for uh, transmitting and identifying information and tying the, the literature together. But it evolved slowly over time. Uh, just to kind of fast forward, uh, of course, and this is all probably old news to those of you who are librarians. After World War II, things changed somewhat dramatically. Uh, there was a realization that investing in research was a valuable, and this wasn't only in the United States, but across the developed world. And, 
uh, countries began to invest in, in research, usually through their libraries or through their sorry, through the university systems in the forms of grants and contracts. And a lot of money came in, and a lot of research was done. And this, of course, generated a lot of scholarship and a lot of, uh, of scientists' uh, manuscripts and so on. And the, and the uh, journal system just really couldn't handle the load. And, uh, and the, the scholarly societies really weren't in a position to increase the journals and the journal space uh, that, in the way that was needed. Prior to this, uh, commercial publishers really weren't involved that much in scholarly publishing. Why would they be when it's a money-losing proposition? Uh, but after this point, they began to dabble in, uh, in publishing, and what they found out is they actually could make money publishing uh, scientific and scholarly journals, and in fact, they found out pretty quickly they could make a lot of money. Uh, this. And again, this is old news to those of you who are librarians, but uh, what it turned out that there's a core set of journals in each field that we as scholars demanded that our librarians purchase, and uh, uh, the publishers, well, to some extent the societies as well, figured out that, you know, well, we could charge whatever we want for these. And it got to the point where the libraries uh, uh, couldn't afford to, keep, to maintain their collections. And um, probably most of you have seen this graph, but uh, it shows the, uh, the rise in the cost of uh, a number of things over the 15 year period between 1996 and 2000. And uh, the consumer price index went up 57%. And of course, the price of a unit's uh, cost of a cereal went up four times that. Uh, and uh, while um, uh, monographs and other types of material went up about around the, uh, the same as inflation. And of course, the net result was that uh, our libraries, even though at a time when science and is growing very fast, actually had a, were only able to subscribe to uh, about 7% less journals than they were. And when it comes to monographs, the problem is even bigger. Uh, and I'm not sure what uh, uh, here at Kentucky, but I know from being on our library committee, during this time, the amount of our acquisitions we spent on, on monographs was about two-thirds that of serials. And then about, well, I think it's actually a little well, towards the middle of uh, like 2004, 2005, it had completely switched over to uh, two-thirds of the, the uh, budget went to serials as opposed to monographs. So there's a real change here. and, and the reason I bring this up is, uh, you know, some of the take-home messages here is, first off, uh, our, our journals really rose out of scientific communities. Uh, the format and structure of our scientific journals evolved over time slowly, and uh, the, uh, as we developed these digitally distributed journals, it didn't happen in a vacuum. There was a lot going on, of course, in scholarly publishing, and a lot of angst between uh, librarians, publishers, and to some extent uh, faculty were involved too, but it was a time of turmoil, and at the time of, the, of turmoil. Uh, I just want to bring up uh, uh, that a uh, little before uh, we got in, uh, into the era where there were um, uh, online uh, journals, uh, uh, Paul Ginsberg's archive, which I expect many of you heard. Archive was a, uh, Ginsberg is a uh, physicist, and archive was a preprint archive that um, uh, preceded the online journals uh, uh, by a little bit. And uh, Archive was a place where physicists could put their manuscripts, other physicists read them uh, and uh, uh, discussed them, edited them. And then interestingly, oftentimes, uh, in fact, most of the times, these physicists took their, uh, their manuscripts and then pub published them in traditional physics journals. And uh, again, uh, uh, Archive took over some of the roles of, journal, of these journals. It took over the, uh, the communication role where scientists communicated with each other. It, 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 it was, in a sense, a form of peer review. And, uh, but these other roles that journals play really weren't served by this preprint archive, and, and physicists still publish their journals, uh, publish their manuscripts in traditional journals. And archives are also important, uh, as, uh, as I'll talk a little bit, it influenced a lot of the development of OA and uh, influenced a lot of the uh, people in, in, in thinking about open access publishing. And, and, it, and it was wildly successful there. Um, the use of it just went skyrocketed uh, by physicists and still is very heavily used. Uh, just to go quickly through uh, you know, the, uh, the development of open access, uh, 
with it, uh, in, in 1993, 1994, it, where it became feasible to really publish uh, scholarly journals that are uh, equivalent to uh, our, um, uh, our paper journals, uh, the number of the journals really grew very quickly. And the first wave were small scholar development journals. Uh, uh, I developed my journal a little bit towards the end of this period, but uh, between 1993 and 1996 or so, uh, several hundred uh, or more journals developed. Many of these were, we weren't, we, uh, I try to speak for myself, were not publishers. We didn't know what we were doing. At least I certainly didn't. I had no idea what I was doing. And many of these journals were uh, pretty amateurish and um, didn't last very long. But some of them hung on, and some of them have turned into really excellent journals. But that was kind of the first wave. Uh, but publishers pretty quickly figured out that uh, publishing was going to move online, and uh, uh, they saw it as a real opportunity and spent uh, literally hundreds of millions of dollars building platforms like Scholar One to support their journals. And by 1998, 30% of the titles in the scientific citation industry were online. Within four years, uh, uh, another uh, it was up to 75% of the journals. Uh, so, you know, this was less than 10 years after it became feasible to put them on. And, you know, 10 years seems like a lot of time, but to move this humongous multi-billion dollar scholarly publishing system online in 10 years was really, uh, at least in my mind, a pretty uh, surprising and amazing feat. Uh, and uh, as Van Osdale and Born pointed out back in 2002, they, they, what happened was what they call the digital flip. And I'd be interested in some of the libraries, uh, what we, uh, uh, their thoughts on this. But he, uh, they felt that about this time, prior to this point, uh, when uh, 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 the traditional publishers put their journals online, oftentimes you had to buy the, uh, uh, the uh, paper version, and then uh, either they gave you the, the online version, or else you, maybe you paid a little bit extra to get it. But apparently about this time, librarians and library consortiums started saying, hey, we want the electronic version. You know, maybe we'll get the paper versions too, but the, what, the, what the, they really wanted were the electronic versions. So in a very real sense, within 10 years, we had switched over to what, uh, at least in terms of a pricing uh, a sense, was a predominant electronic system. So it, it happened very quickly. Um, and if we think about it, I just want to th start to think about what this meant. Uh, if we think about our traditional paper publishing system, there's kind of a symbiotic relationship here where scholars and publishers uh, submit their manuscripts, and with the help of scholars and, publishers, uh, scholars and uh, researchers, publishers uh, select it, typeset it, edit it, print it, distribute it, and then they send it on to libraries, where, the, where well, librarians are traditionally the archivists who keep the material, make it available, organize it, and help us as scholars uh, access and use it. So there's this nice relationship uh, here. When we switch to a, uh, a, a digital system, uh, that relationship changes somewhat. Many of the roles that librarians and, and publishers have done traditionally have, uh, uh, have changed or, or disappeared. Uh, we don't have big printing presses anymore uh, to the extent that we have digital archives. We don't have they need shelves and and uh, bound books and so on. Of course, those still exist to some extent. And, and the relationship changes quite, quite a bit. And most importantly, uh, our journals, it doesn't have to be this way, but uh, to a large extent with uh, um, our traditional publishers, our articles are served directly off the publisher's servers rather than the librarians, directly to the scholars, um, uh, article by article. Of course, librarians play an important point in and purchasing those journals and creating electronic portals by which we access them, but they're directly from the scholars as publishers. And if you think of it, there's an old adage, um, uh, uh, possession is nine-tenths of a law. And uh, if we look back at our old system here, when publishers uh, uh, sold the library a subscription for a journal, uh, the libraries owned that physical volume of the journal, they could uh, uh, keep it forever, they could distribute it to us um, forever, uh, they might cancel a subscription, but with the, the issues you had, you had, you owned. 
Uh, and, and the way that they were distributed to us was under copyright law and fair use, and, and obviously that's a little bit nebulous, but at least it's one set of rules. When we moved to this other model, of course, and again, this is nothing, if, for those who libraries don't know this all too well, uh, yes, copyright exists and so on, but these relationships, is it a question, is this a, uh, a, uh, a, um, uh, a, a purchase relationship or is this a rental relationship? Is, and what rules are this uh, governed? And of course, it's uh, licensing agreements. And uh, being on the library committee and talking to our library <coughs> every uh, month, he, it's a constant struggle. He talked about you know, his struggle, uh, there, and our, our acquisition librarian struggle with this. Under what rules do they get to uh, things like uh, uh, interlibrary loan and so on, and, and this is a constant struggle. So this is one of the, um, the uh, while there's so many, so many benefits of uh, digital distribution, this is one of the big challenges that affects all of us, not only librarians, but all of us in the university community, because it, it, it really, to some extent, threatens the extent that, uh, and the access we have to the literature. But of course, it's good things uh, too. Uh, and, and again, this is probably not uh, news to anybody. But with uh, digital, with digital publication, of course, uh, there's always the first copy cost, and it's expensive to publish, and it takes professionals to publish. Um, but uh, most of the costs are our first copy costs with uh, digital publication, and but with with uh, paper publication, there's the incremental cost. And uh, the nice thing, of course, about digital publication is that we can now um, uh, fund it by other means and then make uh, uh, journals and other material freely available and, um, um, and avoid, among other things, the problem I just uh, talked about. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about uh, the benefits of uh, open access publishing. I think there's been enough conversation on that. If I had more time, I would. But I, I want to jump forward and talk a little bit about, about the history and then where we are in open access publishing. Uh, how many of you remember eBiomed? -Bi eBiomed, in my mind, was one of the most monumental uh, uh, things in open access publishing. And, uh, and uh, this was in 1999. And uh, Harold Varmus was uh, director of the uh, National Institutes in Health. And he proposed eBiomed which was basically going to be an, a, uh, an open archive uh, yeah, of, uh, in biomedical uh, uh, research. And it would have two components. It would have had a, uh, a, a, a preprint uh, server, much like, uh, like archive, Paul Ginsberg's archive. But it was also going to have a series, uh, a uh, archive for um, essentially journal-like things with editorial boards where that would peer review journals. And it would have spanned the whole uh, uh, whole breadth of biomedicine and uh, created were essentially peer-reviewed uh, open access journals, all funded and maintained by the National Institutes of Health. And in its, in its own words, uh, the essential feature would be a plan that simplified uh, 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 instantaneous cost-free access to the whole uh, for any potential reader to be uh, eBiomedic's entire contents in a manner that permitted their each reader to pursue his or her own interests as particularly as possible. And um, so this was a really tremendous proposal. This was you know, the largest funding agency in the world in biomedicine. And he opened it, it was proposed in the May of uh, 1999, and he opened it up for comment. And there was, uh, for three months, and as you might expect, there was tremendous comments. Uh, many of the researchers and librarians thought, thought this was a great idea. But of course, as you might imagine, the commercial publishers and many of the societies, which ironically, uh, prior to World War II, were subsidizing their journals, but they had found that they could actually make money off their journals and subsidize their society. So of course, they felt rather threatened by this and uh, um, uh, were pretty vocal about it. And while being the director of the National Institutes of Health means you carry a lot of weight. Um, it, he was really no match for the uh, uh, entire uh, commercial publishing industry and the major societies in biomedicine. And basically, the proposal got blown out of the water. And what it turned into uh, what we now know as PubMed Central, which is a very nice archive for biomedical uh, literature, but it uh, is not, it was, um, 
uh, the publishers on their own volition being able to, to archive their manuscripts. Of course, that's changed since then, but at this time, it was totally voluntary, and uh, um, there wasn't a huge uptake of this tremendous, uh, really um, uh, pretty ambitious proposal got shot out of the water. But uh, at the same time, I think this pro proposal was tremendous because it opened a lot of people's idea to the, uh, and brought a tremendous amount of discussion about the issue of w should we move uh, the literature uh, to an open access model and find other ways of funding it. Um, and uh, a few years later, there's the Buddhist Press Open Access Initiative where a small group of, uh, of uh, uh, people who are interested in, in open access got together, uh, funded by the Open Inst Society Institute in Budapest, and put together uh, the uh, uh, Open Access, uh, Budapest Open Access Initiative, which really was kind of a manifesto and a blueprint for how we, we could move uh, forward in, the, in, in open access and along two dimensions. And uh, many people consider, that this is where the term open access came from, and many people consider it the start of the open access movement, but I really put it with the e biomed I, I think we owe uh, an Open Access Week a great deal of thanks to Harold Varmus for putting forward this really tremendous proposal and um, uh, taking a tremendous amount of heat over it, uh, but at least uh, uh, bringing Open Access to the forefront. Uh, for, the rest, uh, for most of the rest of the talk, I'd really like to talk about where we've been in Open Access and uh, of course, I think as most of you know, open access is really uh, looked at in two uh, uh, formats. One, uh, uh, green open access or the archiving of existing uh, uh, subscription published, uh, subscription uh, journals, uh, some form of it in a open access archive uh, such as what you have here at um, UK. And then secondly, uh, the development of open access journals. And I like to split that into uh, open access journals that are funded by uh, article processing fees and open access journals that are funded by other means. So uh, first of all, uh, uh, in terms of archiving subscription journals, as I think most of you know, nowadays most publishers allow some form of uh, self-archiving of your manuscripts. Uh, different publishers have different rules, but most of them allow it in some form or another. In most cases, it's the uh, uh, they allow the accepted version of the paper, the, the paper that has been submitted for publication, it's been peer, peer, through peer review, maybe edited uh, and uh, or, or not edited, but maybe um, you know revised based on feedback from the review process, and is finally accepted. That's the version that most publishers allow you to put in your archive. Occasionally, they uh, require an embargo. Uh, so again, it depends on the publishers. Now, what kind of archives do we have? Well, they generally form into uh, three general categories. One is just kind of informal archiving, authors just sticking their, their manuscripts onto their own websites, which is what I do because unfortunately Michigan State doesn't have a repository uh, like uh, other institutions, so that's all I have for my options. But uh, you know, secondly, institutions such as the University of Kentucky have uh, many, uh, oh, okay, moving fast. Uh, as fast than I thought. Um, uh, I'll go through quickly. Uh, uh, um, this, uh, there's uh, institutional repositories, there's disciplinary uh, repositories, <coughs> funded repositories such as, uh, um, as um, um, uh, the PubMed Central, and um, um, yeah, so it's a variety of repositories. Hopefully they, they include uh, metadata which makes them much more searchable. I'm going to move a little quicker uh, since I'm running out of time here. Um, in, in the research, uh, the best I could find, there's about 270 repositories, uh, about 120 of them are institutional, 55 funders, and then in this, the one study, the best study I could find, there's 94 that they weren't really sure what they were. Uh, one of the issues with the repositories, and I know that's something that you're talking about here, is um, compliance or, or its mandates and whether um, mandating that, uh, uh, that faculty should, uh, uh, should uh, archive their manuscripts makes a difference. And the research in, in, uh, suggests that yes, it does make it a difference. Uh, looking at the NIH, which of course has a mandate that it went into effect in 2008, and I think this is pretty representative. 
but it was about 20% when it was just voluntary, went up to about 50% when it was mandated, and, it, and slowly over the last four years, it's gone up to 75%. Welcome Trust, another big uh, funder, it's 55%. Uh, this is a study that looked at uh, institutional archives uh, in terms of um, institutional repositories without mandates, again, similar, it's about 20%. And the institutions with mandates, uh, it jumps up to 50 or 60 percent. So mandates help. They don't get you anywhere near 100 percent compliance. At least that seems to be the, uh, the uh, effect. So uh, where are we in terms of green archiving? Well, probably the best research was done by Bukhrista Bjork and uh, his colleagues. They looked at 2,000 journals, randomly selected journals uh, in 1999 or, or 2009. They took the 2009 year, looked at every article in these 2,000 journals, went on the web and searched and see if they could find it in an archive, in a uh, repository. They found that about 12% of the literature, and that's probably the best estimate we have, about 12% of the literature is now available through green archiving. Uh, and interesting, and, and this is uh, 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 Dr. Bjork's a friend of mine, and uh, this is, he's gonna publish this shortly, but one of the fun things he found, he didn't, he asked me not to give the actual percentages, but unfortunately, a uh, significant portion of the green archiving is actually illegal. People taking copies that they get from their libraries or you know, the actual copy uh, of, the, uh, of the article and sticking it on their website, which of course is a, uh, a violation, really a copyright violation. But there's a lot of that out there, um, unfortunately. And that's obviously not something we want to see. Uh, go, uh, switching to um, uh, Gold OA, the OA journals, um, uh, there's, uh, said there's a variety of models which you can fund OA journals without charging article processing fees. There's a lot of journals out there like uh, 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 Dan's and mine that were just scholar publishers doing it with a little bit of extra support from their library, their department, or whatever, but largely on volunteer e effort. Uh, so there's six, uh, uh, Peter Suber and uh, Carolyn Seiden has found over 609 uh, uh, societies published uh, uh, 702 open access journals. Uh, there's also international efforts like the Science Electronic Library that's based in, in Latin America that publishes almost a thousand art thousand journals and it's an international and international effort. Uh, and of course there's uh, uh, like UK there's a um, lots of libraries and university presses that work with their faculty to publish open access journals where the, where the university provides the uh, publishing expertise, the uh, faculty provide the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the content expertise and, and jointly published journals. Um, I just want to talk quickly about uh, 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 article processing funded OA and then talk about some of, uh, uh, about the extent that it's been found. Uh, the two uh, uh, major uh, uh, first uh, article processing funded uh, journals were Biomed Central and Public Library of Science. Uh, they're both in biomedicine. Most article, pro uh, most article processing charge funded a OA is in biomedicine because Largely, the, I think it's because there's a lot of funding in, in biomedicine and it can be supported. Uh, uh, both these publishers struggled initially but now have uh, become financially stable for somewhat different reasons. Uh, but they showed that it, this was a, a viable, sustainable model and since then there have been hundreds of uh, open access publishers uh, funded by article processing fees. Uh, unfortunately, there's a substrate that are not very reputable, but that's why um, we still form the OWASP, the Open Access Publishers, uh, Scholarly Publishers Association. One of the main reasons is to start setting some standards and like other professions, uh, start trying to bring up the professions and, and ensure that there's quality publishing uh, of article processing fees. Um, just to look at where Gold OA is today, uh, to, uh, uh, about 50% of the articles uh, published in OA journals are published in, in journals that are funded by article processing fees, about half aren't. Um, uh, there, last year, uh, this was just published uh, a couple days ago, about 300 and, uh, uh, 340,000 articles are published each year. Uh, there's about 27% of the journals in the open, directly of open access 
uh, publishers uh, directly open access journals uh, are funded by APC. So there's a lot more articles than journals because uh, APC funded journals tend to publish more. Um, how, how am I doing on time? Okay, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the um, uh, research that Christian Bork and I did found that the average APC is about $900, but there's a big spread with as little as $8 per article up to uh, three or uh, $4,000 an article. Uh, along with uh, just traditional uh, or open access journals that charge uh, an article processing fee, there are now 4,300 what are called pri uh, uh, um, hybrid journals. And these are journals that are published by mostly by uh, 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 traditional subscription publishers that allow uh, authors, if they want to pay a article processing fee, to make just their article open access. Uh, and the rest of the journal subscription uh, uh, but uh, the, uh, that particular article is open access. And the uptake on this, the number of authors that are taking it up on it is very low, only about 1 or 2 percent. And these te fees tend to be pretty high up in the $3,000 range. And uh, personally, I'm kind of glad that this, this model is not working well because in my mind, the publishers are double dipping. Uh, they still charge the library their full subscription and then they charge, uh, you know, for some of the authors, uh, if they want to, the, the money to uh, make it, their article publicly available, but you know, there's, they're, they're still collecting their full subscription fee. They uh, have claimed that they will drop those fees if there's a bigger uptake in hybrid journals. Um, maybe they will, maybe if you believe that, I have a horse farm out there. That, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, that model out there. Another model uh, that uh, model is, is uh, many, um, uh, 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 scholar or what many society publishers do make their journals uh, freely available after a particular period of time, say six months or a year. Uh, and um, it's called delayed open access. And the estimate is about 3.5% of the literature is available through delayed open access. So it's another way that you get access to journals open, uh, um, uh, freely, but uh, you know, it's usually after a year or so. Okay. This is just a, 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 and this was a, literally published a couple of days ago. It shows the growth of open access, different types of open access. Uh, at the bottom, this, uh, the green line are, are subscription journals, uh, regular print journals that, and these are generally um, uh, society journals that make their, uh, make their online version freely available. And as you see, that's, that was kind of the base in 2000. It's grown somewhat. Uh, the blue are, uh, are uh, open access journals that are pub published without uh, article processing fees. And as you can see from 2000, it has grown uh, uh, fairly quickly uh, uh, and has really taken off uh, the last year. And the light blue is the APC funded article uh, uh, charges. And as you can see, that has really taken off in the last couple of years. So uh, uh, based on this study, it looks like uh, 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 Gold OA is growing, even though it only makes up about, I forgot to mention, 8% of the uh, literature right now, it's growing very fast. Um, this is some data I collected out of the Scopus database, which I think many of you know, this is a citation database. It's similar to the journal citation report. So it's much broader, it's owned by uh, Elsevier, and it contains about 8,000 or 18,000 uh, 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 journals. Uh, and it is screened, so these are higher quality journals, but it's uh, unlike uh, the JCR, which is, nobody knows quite what uh, Thomson Reuters uses for their criteria. I think Scopus is a little bit, if you've got a good quality journal and you reply, they will get in. And in Scopus, I was able to get their data, oops, their database, and uh, about 10% uh, of the journals in Scopus now are open access. I, I merged this with the directly of open access journals, and about 10% are open access, about a little over 6% are uh, no fee, and about 4% are fee. When you look at it, it by articles, it's, uh, it's uh, more like about 8%, uh, just like in the, uh, in, uh, across all journals and about split evenly between APC funded and non-APC funded journals. I, I took this database and I 
I uh, looked uh, similar to uh, BPS the York's article. I, I looked from I, I was able to look at it from 1999 to 2010, and I used 1999 as the baseline and looked at percentage growth both in terms of uh, of journals within Scopus and articles within Scopus. And again, as you see, the the red is the OA funded by APCs, and the blue is the OA not funded by APCs. Uh, APC funded OA, uh, particularly when it comes to articles, is growing extremely rapidly. Again, it's only about 8%, but it's growing extremely rapidly. Again, these are the Scopus, so it's, um, these are all better quality, at least reasonably good quality journals. Okay, so what's the kind of the take home message? Um, I, I think um, the norms and conventions and the economics of, of digital publication are we are we're really in a trans trans uh, uh, transition right now? It's been 20 years, but really, I mean, uh, uh, pu professional OA publishing's only been around about 10 years. So I think you know it took 350 years uh, to slowly develop a paper system. It's only been about 20 years. So I think we're really pretty early in this revolution and this change to digital publication. And we're still trying to figure out the economics of it, how it's going to work, how we're going to make it work efficiently. I think we still have a long way to go. I think one form or another, we will end up with an open access. Basically, the predominant means of dissemination will be some form of open access. We find other ways to, pu to fund uh, scholarly publishing. Uh, I think there's this political uh, uh, you know, it's politically, it's, a, it's an easy sell. There seems to be a real interest in it. People are starting to see the value of it. So I think it's going to come along, but we're not sure how, uh, how it's going to come along uh, or when it's going to come along. Uh, I think, at least in the short run, it looks like APC-funded open access is going to be the way that we're going to fund it. Uh, it works okay in biomedicine. I'm not sure it's going to work so well in other fields. Uh, but it's going to be a very slow and painful transition. The problem is, as you well know, uh, those of you who are librarians, we're trying to, we have to support our subscription journal system. We can't walk away from it while we're building up an open access system. So in a sense, we're really kind of double do, uh, dipping. We have to, it costs money to publish it open, open access, and we have to come up with those resources some way or another. At the same time, we can't drop subscription journals. So it, it's going to be a very painful transformation, and I think it's going to take a while to happen. Uh, and the last thing I want to say along this is the APC model needs some work. I think it, it's a viable model. But um, we have problems with low quality publishers. And we also need to have some way to keep the price of APCs reasonable. I mean, some way or another, the, the, the funders are, are somehow, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, 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 the commercial uh, open access journals, and a lot of these people are my friends and so on, but you know, they're not that much different than the uh, um, uh, subscription journal Publishers, in the sense that they're they're um, you know they're uh, um, uh, commercial publishers, and if you if they can get away with charging a little more, they're probably going to do it. So we need some way to keep costs down. Um, and and I, I like to end uh, with what I think are three very exciting models that might help us get it over this hump. Uh, the first one is in uh, high energy physics, uh, the Scope Three. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, consortium, the Scope 3, which is a, a um, and, I, and I'm pleased to say that University of Kentucky, uh, Barry uh, uh, Beth has is, is told me that you are one of the members of Scope 3. And, and basically, this is an interesting model where libraries and funders are getting together and pledging to cancel the subscriptions in high energy physics. They're going to take that money and put it into a pot. Uh, CERN, uh, the wall, the well, you know, CERN in Switzerland, one of the large uh, high energy physics centers, is going to maintain this pod. They think they're going to need about 10, 000, 10 million euros. But they're going to take all this money that we're now spending in subscription journals in high energy uh, physics and, and, and uh, take that. And as a group, say to the publishers, we would like to switch the model. We are now going to pay per article. And we're going to pay based on, uh, and everybody's going to contribute based on each country, based on the amount of their publishing in high energy physics. That's going to, so if the United States is publishing 30% of the high energy physics articles, then we're responsible for 30% of this pot. And they're going to pay it out individually, article by article. It's basically an article processing charge 
to the uh, publishers. And they're already in negotiation with the publishers. They have 16 publishers that they have tentative agreements with. They've, uh, and I just checked yesterday, they have pledges for 40, uh, for 84 percent of the money they need to do this. So I think in the next few years, uh, so uh, they'll be able to pull it off. And essentially, this is a way that they've gotten around that hump and been able to, in one narrow field, hopefully, to move to an open access model, still funded, but funded with the money that we're now already spending for subscription journals. So it's one way. I think I'm. I'm optimistic about it, but I'm not sure as it's how portable it is to other more complex fields, but it seems like it might work in high energy physics. Another, whoops, going right here. Uh, another uh, 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 innovation that I'm really excited about is Pure J. And this is a, uh, I'm not sure if it will, it'll work or not, but they have really good people. The, uh, most of you, I think, have heard of Plus One. It's a, it's been kind of revolutionary journal uh, in, uh, Oh, in uh, um, biomedicine, but the editor, uh, uh, Peter Beinfield, uh, is one of the key people there. Tim O'Reilly, the uh, well-known publisher of uh, computer uh, documentation, and uh, they've, they've uh, formed this uh, company, one of them, I forget his name, uh, but basically what they're, 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 they're uh, it's a membership model where for uh, a base fee of $99, you will be able to publish in PeerJ for life. When, for $99, you get to publish one article a year. Uh, for a little more, $200, you get to publish two articles. For 300 as much as you want. Um, but uh, I'm not sure if they'll be able to pull it on. And also, to, uh, you're expected to review and participate in the community um, as well if you want to maintain your membership. But I'm not sure they'll be able to pull this off. But they, they seem these are really good people. They know what they're doing. And if they pull it off, uh, this may be a way to fund uh, open access publishing that even us in the social sciences can afford. Um, but it's another model. It's an it's an in, a interesting model that may be one way we can go forward. And the last one I wanted to measure is eLife, and this is a collaboration between uh, uh, funders. There's three funders: uh, Howard Hughes Foundation. Uh, the Wellcome Trust in, in Britain and Max Planck Foundation in Germany are working with uh, uh, researchers to form a journal, and they're funding it. The publishers, uh, the um, the foundations are funding it. This is a very high-end uh, journal. They've just published their first four articles, and they have some very innovative uh, ways that they're doing pre peer review, publishing data, and so and so on. So again, this is another model. Uh, and I, I think the wonderful thing about uh, uh, electronic distribution, it opens up the possibility for a whole host of models, and we'll see what happens in the future and how well it will work. Thank you all, and it's been a real pleasure to be able to come to this.